So you just flew in. Yeah, I just, understand. Just landed about 20 minutes ago. Wow. So from Fairbanks. From Fairbanks. We always stop in Seattle on the way. Of course, there's no direct flights to Yakima. Yeah, I wouldn't expect <laughs> that to be the case. Yeah. Uh, so what are you in town for? We're going to be teaching a fascial distortion model course uh, at the osteopathic school here in town at Pacific Northwest University. Spend uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday teaching a different model of looking at the body, try to treat pain. So the model that you're talking about, FDM, is uh, what is commonly referred to or maybe not commonly because yeah, it's not no, all that's, that. That's a correct. Yeah, yeah. It's just not all that common in general. You don't hear... Uh, yeah, so in, in the mid-90s, it originated in 1991 by Dr. Stephen Tapalos, uh, and uh, he was an emergency room physician who began to recognize patterns. And he took those patterns and put it together into kind of a, distilled it down into a framework where patients would rep- repeatedly display gestures and descriptions of their pain. And from that, he categorized six different ways you can mess up the soft tissue of your body. So the the fascia, the shiny tissue that we see in the grocery store meat, you know, that wrapper of everything. Mm -hmm. Back then in the mid-90s, they were just starting to realize the importance of fascia and how it played a role in pain and a lot of, um, it had properties. Before we thought it was packing material, kind of a you know, like an insulator and maybe a, keeps you for, like a bubble wrap for the body. But then they started realizing that it had contractile properties and sensory properties and chemical properties. And that led to a lot of people wondering what was the role it played in the body. When you look at it at, you know, dissection labs like you do in medical school, it's pretty inert. It's not a very interesting material. Um, but when you see it in the living human, it's it's got a lot of... Um, pretty amazing properties pieces of it can snap and reform and it's it's like moving and alive and it's really a fascinating tissue so dr topaldus uh he he made that jump in by observation and treating patients that patients will routinely present in specific patterns and if you can recognize those patterns you can treat them and he spent most of his career trying to forward this model and then he uh he ended up passing away early 49 years old which gets more and more frightening every year as i get closer to that number Mm. um but he passed away leaving behind no american instructors uh there was an instructor in germany georg harar and uh, an instructor in japan keske tanaka and uh when when that happened i was actually headed to my first course when he passed away shortly before that Uh, the first course i was going to take was in hawaii for a it was a world congress that they were having people from all over the world come to attend. And I was just going to, it's just how I got introduced and I was going to go. And it ended up, I arrived and it was more like a eulogy funeral kind of thing. And I didn't have any idea he had passed away because I, I had met him briefly in Alaska when he came through. Um, but yeah, so he, he left behind this, this whole model, the idea, the he had four editions of his textbook that continued to morph with each edition. And so we had to start having Dr. Harar come over to teach us this fascial distortion model so that we could learn it. And quickly I learned that that was going to be prohibitively expensive because you get eight or nine people in a room and you're paying for somebody to come from Europe to teach you something. It's not, it's not going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had some early success with the model in clinical practice. I worked at a really busy walk-in clinic, um, 35,000 visits a year in our clinic, Um, kind of a scale down from the ER. We had ultrasound and CT and labs, but we had patients who would come in and they would give us a gesture and they'd describe what we had been hearing and uh, we treat them and they get tons of relief. So I started to commit myself to saying, this is pretty powerful. Uh, I'd been in practice about 10 years at that point and it was really the most powerful thing I'd seen in medicine. I I said, this is, this has got to be I mean, we're, we're treating people for weeks and years with these conditions, and it can be done in a single visit. So I committed myself to becoming an instructor, started training, practicing hard, taking more um, seminars, making sure that Dr. Harar was coming over to lecture more so that we could get everything we needed. And actually, in 2010 at Yakima, I took my instructor's exam and offered my uh, first course with uh, uh, Dr. Byron Perkins and Marge Gaston and Gene Leonard. And uh, 
from there, it's just we've been continuing to spread. Um, my personal mission is to make it part of osteopathic medicine mm -hmm. um, because I think the fascial distortion model in conjunction with the osteopathic models that we learn is one of the most powerful tools that you'll have in medicine. For people unfamiliar with even osteopathic medicine, can you kind of explain how osteopathic medicine and then the FDM model tie into each other so well? Yeah, so osteopathy is the idea that the body can heal itself, which is, it doesn't sound like a big um, shocking statement, but much of our allopathic or MD colleagues compartmentalize the body and basically they aim to fix something. And so prescriptions and you know our, all of our efforts are at trying to fix that piece of the problem. The osteopathic philosophy, in my opinion, is basically let's get the impediment out of the way and let the body heal itself. The osteopathic manipulative medicine, which is the manual component that all osteopathic students are required to learn in their first two years, it's how to remove those physical elements that are interrupting the body's healing process. And they learn a myriad of techniques. Some are aggressive, some are fairly passive, but there's a broad spectrum of these techniques that we use in the manipulative practice of osteopathy to try and stimulate healing in the body. That's pretty much the biggest difference in, um, you know, you hear people talking about osteopaths think about the whole. Mm -hmm. Most MDs think about the whole, but in our, in our training, we focus on how to get that system working together more fluidly. Um, the FDM is a rapid fire, quick, you can watch a patient walk into the room, you can talk to the patient, they provide you feedback, they give you exactly what you need to do. In most of the osteopathic practice that we learn in school, it's very much you need to practice it, you need to become experts at it, you need to really work to make it part of your, your practice. With FDM, usually in like one of the weekend courses that we're doing here, people will walk out and Monday they'll send me texts and emails saying, I fixed four people today in the clinic and we were in, Tom and I were here in uh, at University Incarnate Word in San Antonio two weeks ago or whatever it was and um, we had an MD who had never done manual therapy. He was in the course and he sent me a list of seven patients he had treated the next Monday all with success. And wow. then and the, the ones that were super impressive to him, he bolded. And that's the kind of, it's a tool that you can really introduce quickly. And what I love about it is anybody can do it, anybody can use it. But for the osteopathic medical student and the osteopathic practitioner, it, it kind of opens up the, your eyes to what these tools that you've learned, how you can apply them all in your clinical practice. Wow, that's incredible. It's it's really strange to me since I've been hearing about this and we've written stories on it and we've talked about it pretty extensively. Um, it seems so strange that such a tool would be behind in the time sort of, that there aren't more people using it or there aren't more people even aware of it. Do you credit that to um, his early death and sort of knocking off the momentum that was going along with that? Or is there, are there other things in play? Yeah, I think there's a bunch of different factors. I think his his initial presentation was of the model was pretty heavy-handed, pretty much forget everything you know, this is the only thing that works kind mm -hmm. of attitude. And with experts, that doesn't go very far. Mm -hmm. You know, So we, we have worked hard over the last eight years to get back in with the American Academy of Osteopathy and present it as an... Uh, uh, collaborative idea rather than uh, pick this or that kind of thing. I think him passing away um, definitely had an impact because he was still developing the message. Um, I think there's a lot of people with a vested interest in various things. Um, you, you know, if you can fix somebody with shoulder pain and they don't need surgery, could take money away from the people who do the imaging, mm -hmm. could take people money away from the hospital system where you do the surgery, could take away money from the surgeon. You know, it's kind of a cynical way of looking at it, but there are those factors that are, are blocking the forward progress. There is a huge factor that we are partly responsible for perpetuating, and that's not having a lot of science about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's three of us in the country who had been teaching FDM up until uh, two years ago, and now we have six uh, instructors, really three who are actively teaching courses. Um, the two of them do uh, several courses a year, and I, I do, Matt Booth and I do, who's a physical therapist out of Boise, we do the majority of the courses. Um, but it's interesting because the teaching is, you know, 
full-time deal. We travel on the weekends. It's my vacation time from work. Um, I, I get here, it's stress on the family because you're not home. Mm-hmm. So you're committing to doing that. Or you do the research. Or you try to do both. But you have a limited bandwidth. You know How, mu- how much can you do? How much research can you do? Um, FDM research should be super simple. Um, we have a great study that Josh Boucher, a DO out of Florida, just, just is putting together for publication. Uh, shows statistical significance of heel pain treatment in people with plantar fascia-like symptoms. Um, so it's a great study. It's really one of the early ones that kind of shows, yeah, we can re- replicate what we're doing. But doing good research, anybody who's ever talked to people who are done research themselves will tell you it's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. For my clinic, I see between 100 and 120 people a week. There's not a lot of time for research. Mm-hmm. And then you're doing the teaching. So you... I think our next stretch is to find that research time and and get people doing the research. Because in this country, we are very Mm -hmm. evidence-based. In Europe, they have have 3,000 practitioners, 24 instructors in in, uh, Europe. And there's not nearly the emphasis on the importance of doing research because to them, their mentality is very much, it works. Mm -hmm. Why would we bother to research it? Yeah. You know, there's there's no need. It just works. Just do it. And, you know, we tried to present it that way, which can offend some people. Um, but realistically, if we can provide this as a tool that people can use to try to get people to better, then maybe we'll get more people interested in doing the research. Yeah. So I think the research has been an issue. Um, and there's a lot of egos at play, too. There's a lot of people who practice um, osteopathic medicine that have their pet projects you know some people may look at me and say oh all he does is fdm and that's i couldn't be further from the truth i use every tool i was taught plus some i've learned since we incorporate them and we look at them through the model we look at them the model isn't just techniques it's a way of looking at the human body that says oh this could lead to pain so you know surgeons think in this model we've we've got uh, many surgeons who've taken our courses neurologists once they understand that it's a way of thinking then it becomes a piece of the tool box, you know, a tool in the toolbox, and you can start using it. Yeah. What are some of the, the applications for it, like the realistic things that people might overlook? And you've talked about surgery and all those big steps that end up being really costly for the patient, not only financially, but time-wise, and just the stress on their life that goes along with those things. What are some common ailments that people face that yeah. FDM has, has been shown to work for. Yeah, I, I mean, any musculoskeletal complaint, muscle strains, sprains, any of the typical ones, ankle sprains. Um, we have lots of stories of people who walk in on crutches in a post-op boot because they have a sprained ankle and they w- leave carrying it. Um, it it's, a, it's actually one of the common treatments for us that I always call it the kind of, when you can treat a sprained ankle and have people walking on it, as a practitioner, it's one of those aha moments that maybe there's something to this whole idea. A um, lot of low back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain. Before I started doing FDM, I would say, you know, I didn't have a whole lot for people with shoulder pain. Now it's probably 30% of what I do. Wow. Yeah. Feet pain, mm-hmm. people with plantar fasciitis, apparently in the medical system, anybody with pain in their foot, it's going to be called that regardless mm-hmm. of where it is. Um, but we treat a lot of feet. Actually, I have a podiatrist in town who is one floor above me in the clinic, and he refers all the people who, with that diagnosis down to us because he says, my injections aren't that helpful, and why don't you try? And if you, not, if you can't get them better, then send them back. So a lot of musculoskeletal things, um, you can pretty much, the way I look at it is in medical school, your big goal is to develop a differential. You want a differential diagnosis. So you come in with a sore throat. It can be anything from a virus to a bacteria to heartburn to, you know, go to all the way down to the list to the terrible things that you don't even want to think about. So that's what we spend all of our time in medicine developing. And with FDM, I like to insert that early. So it's like, okay, you come in with, you know, pain in your neck. Sure, it could be the herniated disc radiating to the arm, and that's where we normally start. But more often than not, if we look at the gestures and we watch, we can try treating some things with not a lot of um, risk. I mean, there's always risk in anything we do, and the biggest risk is if you're not prudent, you could delay a diagnosis, Mm -hmm. you know, of something more severe. But uh, we, you know, we try to focus on how to, when to use it, use it early. If it doesn't work, move down your differential and go to the, you know, the diagnostic tests you need. 
Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think having it as part of that differential diagnosis just makes it so that you're, you're not really, you're not eliminating any options from the medical world. You're not saying that you don't believe in medicine or, you know, physical therapy or, you know, any of the traditional treatments. You're just saying, why not use this early? Cause mm -hmm. every day in clinic, I see people who've had pain for 10 years and they walk in and the student will treat them with me and they walk out without pain and the patient's going, why did I have this for 10 years? And, you know, then they see that it's the student who's treated them and they're, they're just shocked because they've seen 10 providers, they've gone all over the country, often they've gone to Mayo or Virginia Mason or, you know, one of the bigger centers where they are going to get the specialty care and then they come to Podunk Fairbanks and they get a treatment that changes their life. Yeah. It's incredible to think about it. It's such a, I, again, I, I just keep coming back to it because when we talk about it, it seems like such a tool that so many people should be using. When you talk about the, the use of it and you say that there's little risk for people listening who don't understand, and I'm probably one of those people, what is it that you do with FDM? So if somebody comes in with, yeah, with so neck pain or... If you come in with pain, you're going to gesture how it hurts. You're going to describe something and you're going to tell us it hurts in a specific way. Three of the d distortions, they call those. So there's six distortions in the body, the, the six ways you can mess up the shiny tissue. With that, um, three of them are pretty painful to have treated. Um, you press on the body with, usually with your thumb, in a specific way to address the, basically to straighten out that shiny tissue um, so that it doesn't hurt anymore. Though that can be painful, can leave some bruising, um, in my clinic, I joke with the, my patients that I say sweating and swearing are two things that are perfectly okay in here, but no biting, punching, or kicking. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable process, but they go through it and it lasts seconds and you can relieve long-term pain. I had a seven-year-old in the other day, first time they had been in there, they didn't know what to expect. And I think everybody thinks we're going to just, you know, beat them when they walk through the door but you can you can get a kid ready for it they want to be back running and playing so they want their back pain gone mm -hmm. okay this is going to hurt for a second but you'll be better once you've treated somebody and even kids they they don't have much tolerance for that pain anymore they're like hey that thing came back you know i want it gone and they come running in when my kids were little you know they they'd sprain an ankle running around in the yard they'd come in and say dad fix this and you know they had about a 40 minute window before they'd come in and get it fixed they didn't they didn't want to have anything long term we see that with adults too they they understand that there's potential for bruising. There may be some redness on the skin. You may get some what we call petechia, the little blood blisters, you know, the blood vessels popping under the skin. Um, it feels bruised for a couple days after a treatment. Generally, there's not a lot of dangerous side effects. Um, there's always risks, and we talk about that in our courses. But uh, for the most part, people are willing to go through a little bit of torture, we call it quote unquote, mm -hmm. just to be pain free. Yeah. As somebody who's had ankle injuries in the past too, I know that even something as simple as a sprain lasts so long and it just lingers and the pain, you, you would wish that there would be something quick that could fix it. And there never seems to be. Anytime I've ever sprained my ankle, you kind of just settle into the fact that this is going to be six weeks of annoyance and then maybe I'll start to feel better afterwards. Um, so if somebody was coming in with a sprained ankle, going back to the application of it, what is it that's going on under the surface that's making it feel better so quick? Yeah, so there's there's a whole aspect of that fascial tissue, that shiny tissue that it's distorted or disrupted in a particular manner. Now, the pain science people in the in the country, they'll they'll have specific neurologic pathways and chemical changes that are happening. We try to keep it simple in the model, which sometimes I think you asked what are some of the things that hold it back. Mm -hmm. People are like, "Well, that's way too simple." You know, it, you, it can't be real. And Tom always says, the, you can't confuse um, oh, confusing complexity with sophistication. Yeah. And so, um, you know, so when you come in, there's specific things based on how you, you would demonstrate it. But there you can have a twist or a wrinkle in the fascia, just like you have a twist or a wrinkle in your clothing. Well, if that happens, what do you do? You iron it out. Mm -hmm. um, you can have an insertion point where the fascia connects to the bone. And that can be specifically tender. That insertion point is an ever-changing junction. And when you sprain it, it can't change anymore. And your body freaks out and doesn't like it to be unmoving. And so you got to get it moving again. Um, and then you can actually have, we think of fascia as like a matrix, like a, a honeycomb. And some of the matrix can actually protrude up through another piece of it. 
and for that you have to push it back down and push it through mm -hmm. and so yeah you just you're you're basically trying to get this living mass of tissue to function smoothly tom perfect example here um when we you were kind enough to come and speak at one of our events about the story that we wrote on uh, dr reeves mm -hmm. um for people who haven't read the story dr reeves was a gentleman in this area who had back pain and he had gone through so many of the tests that you were discussing which end up being so costly and so time consuming and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him uh, and it was some sort of back pain and uh you had gone in and treated him with fdm and it basically changed his life and he he beforehand kind of felt hopeless and a bit stuck and that quick treatment he said it took 15 minutes and immediately he was back to being able to play with his grandkids and hike again and do all the things that he loved and it was just such a simple process what is it that attracted you to i know that you talked about your your kind of rural roots and that's something i want to get into more but uh as far as attracted me to osteopathic medicine it was definitely the rural roots uh, as far as fdm specifically it was the efficacy and the speed because it actually took me longer to explain to Dr. Reeves and his family what I was going to do than it did to make that pain go away. Mm. And then it actually took even longer than that for them to fully wrap their heads around the fact that the pain's gone. Why did it take this many years? And then I had to go see other patients. So I don't know. I still don't know how long that exactly took. But uh, it, it was definitely uh, growing up in kind of the middle of nowhere, Idaho, um, wanting to have some or preserve some level of autonomy, being able to fix something. Um, or, you know, I, I did search and rescue for, for a few years and it's always one of those, if I'm going in to get somebody, I really hope they can walk out because I don't want to have to carry them. Mm. So when, uh, I remember asking very early on, like, okay, so what sort of stuff can I use for like wilderness medicine type stuff? And, and one of the, he's now graduated, but you know, ex-military guys just puts his copy down and says, take an FDM class and picks his copy back up and. And that was, I kept hearing about this, this mysterious FDM that they wouldn't tell us or they wouldn't teach us early on in the first year. And I asked, well, why, why, why can't we? Are we just not good enough? Because I'll, I'll study up. Maybe it's fine. No, it's um, easy enough to apply that you'll stop learning the other stuff that you need to, to know to pass boards and that you can certainly use while looking at things through an FDM class, so to speak. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those... It's super simple, makes a lot of sense, easy to follow, easy to apply, but it could be a crutch for some people. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, just like what Dr. Cavus Trent said about, oh, you only do FDM. I've developed that same sort of like uh, reputation at school. That's really not the case. I still do all sorts of stuff. I might still think about this fascially, mm -hmm. but I'm still doing all of the other techniques, the counter strain, the HVLA, the facilitated positional release, the myofascial, all the stuff. I still use all of those tools. Yeah, if the, it makes sense because if there's a tool that works more effectively and more quickly and can get the patient back to what they want to be at, then you would think that that would be your first option. And when they say things like you only concentrate on FDM, it's like if it could potentially be the fix before all these other things that are way more complicated come in, then why wouldn't you take that approach? Right. One of my partners, uh, who's actually a graduate of the school here in Yakima, Jen Rebar, she, she went to Michigan State where she did her neuromuscular medicine residency, which is a specialist in OMM, essentially. And uh, one of her colleagues asked her at the time, well, how often do you use FDM? And she said, um, FDM-specific techniques? maybe 70% of the time. But she said, I'm always thinking in FDM. She, she was up with us in Fairbanks for training. So two of her years of training, she was in Fairbanks. So she was uh, side by side with me every week. We were working together. We had a longitudinal OMM rotation. So she got to be in the clinic all the time. So it basically came part of how she thought. Um, but yeah, you know, the getting it is part of your lexicon of of thought it's it's one of the reasons i like coming to the medical schools if i get a group of practicing doctors that come into a class i have to convince them of what i'm saying is reality mm -hmm. if i have medical students they are much more open to seeing what's before their eyes we treat people in front of them they get better or better yet they treat people and they get better and it becomes a fact you know so they don't need more information about it they just see hey 
I did this, that patient got better. It's actually what got me interested in osteopathic medicine in the first place. I was in the middle of some tough subject in the first year, and uh, my sister-in-law was pregnant and could hardly function. She was thinking she was going to have to st stop work and, you know, like six months into her pregnancy. And I went home and I said, well, can I try something? And she's like, sure. And, you know, I didn't hear anything. And a couple of weeks later, I just happened to call her and say, you know, how'd you do? She goes, oh, pain's gone. I went back to work. I haven't had a pain since. And at that point, you know, as a first year med student, you don't know a lot. And mm -hmm. everybody makes it pretty clear you don't know a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they kind of beat you down with all of this volume as you have to learn. But yet I just took care of her pain. And I was like, wow, I better pay attention to this stuff because that's a pretty cool tool. And that was even before FDM. So a lot of the osteopathic techniques we have are wonderful. And they, they've been around for years and years. But teaching practicing physicians many of them are like you know i've been doing that for a long time and this describes it better this explains it better or i can more understand what i was trying to do before so the techniques that you know like you said we're not trying to supplant a technique or or a theory or an idea it just helps it helps a lot of the students grasp it much mm -hmm. quicker you know and then they can get results my big uh push for the schools to have it involved is if I can take a student like Tom did with Dr. Reeves, try to tell him he can't do that in the future as a practicing physician. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to treat that person's pain with your hands. I experienced a rotation where I was not allowed to do any, any OMT, osteopathic, because the preceptor, quote, didn't understand what I was doing, so I couldn't do any of it. So I ended up sending people, you know, typical standard of care referral, oh, we're going to send you to a, a PT. If they don't get back to you in two weeks, call us. It felt criminal. Absolutely criminal. Personally, I think if you get this tool into the osteopathic hands, it's going to explode it even further. That being said, though, we have a lot of super qualified PTs, um, chiropractors, um, athletic trainers, nurse practitioners, podiatrists, dentists. They all can learn to think in the same model and use the techniques. Um, I just think because of the additional tools that the osteopath learns, it becomes, you know, I call FDM is like your cordless drill. You know, the first time you get a cordless drill and you can, you can use the hammer drill to put in a sheetrock screw, everything, you know, every picture in your house is hung with that thing, right? <laughs> You've gone are the hammer and nail. <laughs> but you still need those to build a house. Mm -hmm. and, and so if, you, if you're using those, the, the tool, that super powerful tool, all the time, it just, it, 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 you get better and better with it. Yeah. And if we can give that to MDs and chiropractors and everybody else, it just makes the whole system better. Um, one of the things that early caught me in FDM was that the cost savings that you kind of hinted at earlier is you get these patients who come in. I had a lady this week, actually, who came in and her husband came with her. It's about her fifth visit or whatever. And uh, her husband came with her to meet me because we had made such a change in her life, which is kind of weird because I think what I do is pretty cro -Magdon. I It's not, it hurts here, so I'm going to push on it and try to fix this problem. Mm -hmm. But he came in to talk, and she came in to talk, and he was, he was just, we didn't really have to treat her, but they just needed to talk. And he said, we've been all over the country looking for help for her for 10 years, and you've seen her five times, and she's walking again, she's lost weight, and you think of the expense, not just to them as individuals who've had to cut back. She said, I never would have even considered. She's going to CrossFit now, which she's like, I never, it would never have been on my radar that I could even go. So she's in a CrossFit gym. She doesn't do a lot of lifting yet, but it's there. And I gave her permission. It's like, hey, if your body says you can start, do it. She uses the ellipticals, all those things. But he was beside himself that you can help her and I've been to Mayo Clinic and all these places, and nobody had anything to offer her. And they just say, yeah, you know, it's kind of what you've got. One of the big things with FDM is you, we encourage movement, we encourage activity, which is a very osteopathic philosophy, is if we can get the body moving, it can heal itself. And so with FDM, we hear over and over again that there's hope. You know, you, you go into the orthopedist's office with hip pain, 
Um, we've had this situation in Boise one year where a guy came in, he, he was a big guy, but he loved running. And he was a triathlete. You look, took one look at him and he looked like a linebacker, not a triathlete. But he loved to run. And he came in and he said the uh, orthopedist told him that he shouldn't run anymore. And I said, well, why? They said, my hip's worn out. And I said, okay, so what's their solution? They're going to replace my hip. And I'm thinking, I'm going, so if it's worn out, why can't you run? I said, if you didn't have pain, could you run? He said, well, yeah, but they don't want me running on it. I said, so if I can get your pain to go away, why wouldn't you run it? Because it's worn out. What are you going to wear it out more? Mm -hmm. And so we actually treated him in front of the group in Boise, and he, he got pain-free. And I said, go run. And he was like, what? And I said, yeah, go run. And he, he just kind of was shaking his head. And he uh, texted us later. It was an MD who brought him in. And he said he sat in his car for 45 minutes crying because I had given him permission to run. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous. Best part of that story is his MD who brought him in learned the techniques very well. So she was able to treat him about every six to eight weeks and keep him pain free until the insurance company wouldn't pay for it anymore. And then he went and got his hip replaced because it was, you know, how much, how many thousands of dollars? It's probably a lifetime of FDM treatments for one hip replacements. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of it is insurance companies looking at what are they willing to pay for? I mean, personally, if I owned an insurance company, every person would need to be treated with FDM before they get imaging, before they get other things, because you're going to save money. I had a gentleman who was a Medicaid patient, unemployed, really nice guy, fell off a friend's roof while he was um, helping him up on the roof, and he, he had a compression fracture in his spine. And uh, in our model, you, when something's compressed, you have to recompress it. It makes people a little nervous with a fracture, and you, know, you want to make sure you're in your scope of practice. But he came in with a... A, a splint on his body, so like a body cast, uh, something you could take on and off. And he was in a wheelchair. And he came in and I said, okay, show me where it hurts. And he gave us pretty classic gestures. And I treated him and he stood up and he took off the splint and he was pain free. And he's like, thanks. And, uh, but the best thing for me was when he looked at me and he said, I'm on Medicaid and they have wanted to do all of these things, all these imaging tests and all of this stuff. He said, wouldn't it make sense to save money for the system and just have me see you guys first? And I, I, I thought it was pretty, you know, insightful for him to say, if I go there and get better, I don't need to go through all the imaging and testing and everything that they want me to do. Um, you know, you have to have appropriate follow-up after a treatment like that, but his pain was gone. And in this opioid epidemic that we're in, we can decrease the amount of opioids. And so if we can take away pain, you know, if you break a bone, we can help you with the pain, it still needs to heal. Mm -hmm. um, but if I could decrease your pain by half or two thirds, wouldn't that be great? You know, our prescriptions would shrink down and everybody who's scrutinizing how many prescriptions we're writing now could take a breath and say, oh yeah, they're using the least amount possible. Yeah, it seems like an obvious solution for so many of the problems that people talk about when they talk about healthcare, when you talk about over prescriptions and you talk about the costs. If there's a solution out there that takes away those two problems, which are major problems that everybody, I think, would bring out as probably one and two pretty close. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I think that's the big emphasis for the American uh, Fascial Distortion Model Association is trying to get it into the mainstream. Dr. Topaldis had a dream of making it mainstream medicine. He had a dream of every emergency room in the country should be able to treat a sprained ankle like that. And I, I continue to believe that. I, I think it's... It's, it's a no-brainer. It's one of those things that, yeah, why not try? Um, there's concerns about liability in the emergency room. What if you miss something? Um, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is being realistic. If something doesn't work, there might be something else going on, so you have to pursue it. We, we talk about it as a medical model. We don't currently train massage therapists in it because it's a little bit more than the liability that they have and the medical training. They completely understand it but they don't have that, that medical training that what if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, when we do a lot of the testing internationally, if we, we have something that's called an international certificate and you can take all three modules and practice for a year and then you can come take this exam and it's recognized throughout the, country, the world. And uh, um, for that exam, often you get presented with a case that doesn't respond to FDM. 
And what we're testing is how quickly do you go into the medical world? You know, is this something potentially bad in the body that you don't want to miss? Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to keep all of your medical training, whatever you're, you know, whether you're an athletic trainer to a physician, and, and, you know, surgeon, you got to keep all of that. Um, but you want to make sure that I think you got to put it up on the differential. It'd be like somebody always seeing sore throats and just prescribing an antibiotic and never considering that it could have been a viral illness. Mm -hmm. You know, you just... We're not going to add this. And like you ask, I can't answer the question. Why don't more people say we need to have this on board? You know, I, I, I lay awake at night trying to figure out why. Why do people not want to buy into this? I bet. Yeah, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about was being a, a school PNWU that serves rural and underserved communities. I imagine that this is a huge benefit to communities like that. When you talk about somebody coming in with hip pain and or people coming in and having to see specialists, having to be put out to all these different groups. If you're somewhere like Fairbanks or some of the more extreme regions of Alaska or even different parts of rural America, odds are you don't have easy access to those groups. How is this, uh, especially up in Fairbanks, how have you seen this come into your practice to, to affect the lives of the patients? It's really been an interesting progression. We have about 100,000 people in Fairbanks, and uh, you know that's not a very big town. We currently have six full-time practitioners of FDM, OMM, and a lot of people who use it in the clinic, family practice, urgent care. Our surgeon thinks in the model. Our OB doctors think in the model. And, you know, I always tell people, I don't care if you do OMM or FDM, but it, at least you know when to refer. You know, so I was trained as a family doctor, and I know when somebody needs to go to the cath lab and get their heart looked at but I'm never gonna be the guy to do it. But that wouldn't prevent me from referring you to the cardiologist when you need it. So if you walk into the cardiologist, I want them to go, hey, this isn't your heart, this is your chest wall, you need to go see these guys. And so in Fairbanks we've developed, um, and I think it's mostly in part to, due to the FDM, the efficacy, the speed, you know, all of the things that we tout with the FDM is developed you know, most of my practice has developed. It was me half time, and now it's six people um, over about five to six years. Um, it's been because of word of mouth. One patient gets treated, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, that was amazing! I need to go. You need to go see this person." And so we keep having that word of mouth. There's some advertising in the community, but most of it is just the success of the treatment. I was putting together a lecture not too long ago. And um, with our six, if I just count the six, there's probably more like 25 people who are using it intermittently in, in the community. Um, but there's six of us who, it's our sole practice. If you take that population to like Minneapolis, there should be 150 people that you could just look up in the yellow pages if they still existed and find, you know, a practitioner of OMM, FDM. I can't find somebody to refer to in the cities that does manipulation. Seattle is worse. You know, you should have a stable of several practices of 20 providers or more. It would be a, over 100 people in Seattle that you should be able to refer to. But I can't, I've got patients who've either moved or their family is near one of these big towns. There's nobody to treat them. And it's just one of those things where if there's a, there was a misnomer for a very long time that you can't make any money doing manual treatments and that was completely false but at the early days of pnw one of the faculty members was quoted to the students as saying don't bother with that you can't charge for it <clears throat> and uh you know i was like oh you want to look at my tax return because i i can charge for it and i do okay i'm not i'm not going to complain about my income so it's it's interesting but the the fact that alaska has grabbed it and used it I think there's several things. I think it's the remoteness. You can't just rush off to the major specialist. I mean, we have a lot of great specialists in the big cities like Fairbanks and Anchorage, but people want to be active. They don't want to be down and out. So they're looking for anything that'll get them back out onto the ski trail and, you know, hiking and running. And I think we might have more per capita ultra marathoners than anywhere else. It's just ridiculous how many people are out there doing this stuff. They like to be active. They want to get better. And, it, and I think it's why Dr. Topolis got um, interested in Alaska. He was not super well received in the United States, 
but he came to Alaska three times and the, peop- the physicians there embraced it. And I, I think it's a little bit of, of our mentality it was much more like the Europeans is like, it works. We're not going to quibble over why. Maybe mm-hmm. we can figure that out at some other point. And a lot of our patients love it. You know, they, they get better, they go out, they do what they want. Um, it's great for my business because I know they're going to go do something else. You know, they're six months from now, they're going to pick up a snow machine and they're going to hurt their back. And yeah, they'll come back in. You know, they'll remember how it got better. It could be three years in between. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of that. I think it's a military maxim. If it looks stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. <laughs> you know, there's a uh, utility seems to, to take, you know, precedence, especially in rural areas. If it's repeatable, if it's not hurting people, if I can reliably apply it, it's useful, and I'm going to keep using it. The funny thing about the charging or not charging, again, on that rotation, yeah, I don't have to worry about billing as a student, but even if I didn't, wasn't able to charge for that procedure, if someone's showing me that, I'm supposed to be caring for these people. Mm-hmm. I'm supposed to be helping them get better. How it, it's incumbent upon me to to do whatever I need to do, and if it's going to take me thirty seconds to do it, okay, I'll get a scribe. <laughs> That's how I'm going to pay for it. I'll have more throughput. Mm-hmm. So it's just you know char- charging for it. That's kind of a I consider that a false argument. It's it's just really. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like something that you shouldn't have in mind. If you're thinking in those terms, then you're probably not in the right field. Well, and it's interesting because in a lot of a lot of physicians who don't use osteopathic manipulation, they say it just takes too much time. And medicine's a throughput business, mm-hmm. um, and and you know that is a very difficult thing for physicians to get their mind around and people. You know, we don't realize that physicians work on a conveyor belt. You know, you, and people are coming through the office. Um, volume drives your income as a physician. So the more you can see, the, the more money you make in most such situations. Some people are flat salary, you know, but most of us are on production of some, some variety. Um, the people who say they don't have time for it are trained in the very traditional osteopathic way. And I think, honestly, some of those osteopathic trainers have tried to make themselves special and say, you know, you need to do this all the time to be any good at it. And you need an hour long appointment. Well, you're going to, you're, you're not going to be doing very well financially for your system, for yourself. Um, if you're doing hour long appointments. Now that's not to be said that there aren't some appointments that go a long time. I mm-hmm. mean, but if your standard appointment is that long, it just doesn't work in our healthcare environment at this point. So a lot of the physicians who's, you know, are in ER training or family practice training, peds, they they see that hour-long appointment as just this kind of like nebulous nirvana that they're never going to be able to reach. And I don't have that kind of time with patients. When they get the FDM, we work with a group, for example, a University of Minnesota um, Mayo Clinic Mankato residency, and we go there to teach once a year. And they want us to come teach once a year because the residency is three years long. They get each module before they graduate. The reason they like us coming to teach is because the residents learn how to use osteopathic manipulation in conjunction with the normal family practice exam. The director of that program, she, she quoted as one of her patients came in, and he's a typical guy, in mid-50s, diabetic, hypertensive, high cholesterol, with back pain. He comes in and she says to him, I will treat your back but then the rest of the visit, you got to talk to me about your diet and all this other stuff. He's like, yeah, yeah, just treat my back. So he, she treats her back five minutes, leaves 25 minutes for her to talk about his blood pressure management, his diet, you know, how they're going to control all these other things. So if you learn to do it quickly, she can, she can have it as a piece of family medicine. Now, there's a lot of us who do osteopathic manipulation just full time. That's all we do. That was by necessity because the demand was there. So many patients needed it. Now, if all of the family practice doctors in town knew it, then there wouldn't be a need for us. You could maybe one person in our town would be doing it as kind of that. This is uh, this is an out there kind of problem. And I don't it's beyond my scope, Mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, just like you have people who take care of blood pressure every day and then there's the specialist who takes care of it when you can't control it musculoskeletal stuff if it was done on the primary care level like it should be with everybody knowing fdm and omm 
then they would, you know, there wouldn't be needs for the specialists because you'd have people who were able to do it right in the office. And that's the fun thing about Fairbanks and our family practice department is that's much more what we do. I don't get simple injuries anymore referred over from my colleagues. I get the complicated things because they've already fixed the stuff in their office. Mm. It gives them some hope that, you know, as a, as a family doc this day and age, a lot of the stuff you see is internal medicine, complicated medical problems that kind of are chronic. And so when they somebody comes in with an acute injury, they get all excited that they can fix something quickly, and then they do it, and they create it, create an even better relationship with their patient, and then they go on to treat their chronic issues that, you know, are going to be there for a long time. Mm. Outside of Fairbanks being uh, kind of a uh, a mecca for this sort of practice with six people having this skill, and you mentioned other places that should have so many more not having it. Are there places in the world that kind of provide the example of this is the way that we could follow this and this is how it works? Yeah, in Germany and Austria, they have a lot of practitioners. Um, Many of the practitioners are physical therapists. Um, They have a lot of um, people who just know FDM. That's all they do. I think that in my my view that's a little scary because you want to you want to have that background medical background to try to keep it um you know grounded i guess is a good word but um yeah other places in the country i think we have smatterings of people here and there you know like we have practitioners throughout the country but there's not a big constellation in any one area we've talked about trying to find a home for training um you know, our, our efforts have been to get it into the schools so that, you know, like this weekend, I think we have 70 people signed up. When those people go forth, the students go forth. Not all of them are students in this course. Some of them are practicing. But when they go out into their rotations, they'll bring it with them. Mm-hmm. And it's much more of a grassroots spread. Um, how do you get it to permeate all of, all of the different areas of medicine? Uh, there's there's some other teachers of of the model out there, and their their students have gotten into professional sports. Um, so a lot of the baseball teams, football teams, they're already using it. That was my next question for you. Yeah, the German national soccer team has had a FDM practitioner on the sidelines for like 15 years. The Sochi Olympics had two FDM practitioners following the athletes. Um, again, though. There's something about sports medicine. I think most doctors at least some point in their life have thought of themselves as somewhat of an athlete. Mm-hmm. And so they pay attention during the sports medicine lectures in medical school, and then they think they know it. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, I'm good. I, I, I know how to treat his brain. Well, we've got a different way to treat it. No, no, I, I know. And, you know, so there's a lot of people who want to be that sports medicine doc. And if they even if they've gone through a sports medicine fellowship, often those people are primarily injection. Um, I've got a lot of good friends who've done sports medicine fellowships, and it's it's procedural-based, not hands-on osteopathic. Now, the best sports medicine docs I've worked with are the ones who do both. You mm-hmm. know, They can do an injection, they can do manual medicine, and if they have FDM, they kind of rise above. But, yeah, a lot of the sports teams are starting to pick it up because, I mean, you look at one of these people with, you know, million-dollar contract, and if you can put them back on the – field right away it's going to be huge benefit yeah that comes back to when you were talking about there doesn't necessarily especially in europe you're saying there doesn't have to be all this evidence to say it works and we're going to use it because we see that it works and we're going to use it are there teams are that you're aware of in the united states that have taken this on because like you're saying there's a huge financial risk to having a player who's injured if you could get him back out on the court or the field or whatever the case may be yeah i'm not saying it's causative but i know the cubs started using it right before that world series thing so (laughs) i'm not making that connection it's curse reversing is what you're saying (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) um yeah it's it's interesting because that whole i mean the other aspect we look at and we're actually have some meetings this weekend while we're here is the military Mm -hmm. um i i took care of i take care of a lot of military in fairbanks we're very military heavy we got three bases in and around fairbanks and if i look at the pilots just the pilots and you see you know, millions and millions of dollars spent on these people to train them. And uh, I, I had a, one F-18 pilot come in, and he had neck pain. Ever since they changed the helmet, he had neck pain. And uh, so he comes in. He's thinking about getting out of the military because it's bothering him so much, and he's coming up for a renewal. Happens to be an osteopath kid who's tried to treat him with the traditional mo- modalities. He flies up on what's called a red flag exercise, and 
I, I don't have an official referral, so I just take him into the back of the clinic, treat his neck, his pain's gone. And he, he then comes back to touch it up, make sure we're good, and he's fine. Since then, he stayed in the military, became a test pilot. And, you know, you think about an F-18 pilot, I can't even, I'm sure one of the military people can tell you what the dollar sign about training that person is. And it's got to be any person you can keep in the military with that high level of training. Mm-hmm. It's got to be, I mean, it should be worth the whole organization getting providers. Um, we also have the special forces, the Navy SEALs. We were teaching a course in San Diego and we treated a Navy SEAL. It is the husband of one of our attendees. And the next morning we showed up and there was eight SEALs standing outside the door waiting wow. for a treatment. You don't say no to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was pretty cool. Well, and what was the thing Paul was talking about where you know, the people who are on profile, they're on basically the, the red shirts of the sick bench. Mm-hmm. They're not producing. They're not doing their job in the, in the military, but the military is still paying them. They're of no, they're of no value at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. they're not deployable. And if they're not deployable, then they're a liability to the military. So you don't want to be on profile. And if you're on profile, it's a bad thing. Yeah. And so he's, 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 we've had several incidents where people have learned this and they've taken their number of profile patients and basically dropped it one guy i can't remember the number but it was essentially he had a battalion of people who were all on profile and they started working on them and within several months to a year they were they just had a few um that was one of the the reasons josh uh, boucher did the study in in florida was he looked at musculoskeletal injuries that he thought he could treat with fdm and the average length of profile for a soldier with foot pain was 400 and some days and so imagine being a liability to the military for over a year. And what he's shown is statistically significant reduction of that within months, weeks, days. And it's just, you know, the, as, a, as a taxpayer, I'm like, we need to treat everybody with this. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't work, let's go down the rabbit trail of what we usually do. But it only makes sense. Yeah, you, at least it's another option to consider, as you mm-hmm. were saying. Why do you have any sort of explanation for why more people aren't jumping on board with this, especially sports teams? It seems like such an obvious application for it. Uh, we, we, uh, the sports teams are interesting because they have expertise and they value that expertise and they value their connection to um, patients, their, their athletes. Mm-hmm. And you have to know the right people, know the secret handshake. You can't get in. Um, we joke that we know that Tiger Woods has got an HTP in his low back, but even the guys with the right training, the right credentials to treat these pro golfers, one who's here this weekend, you can't get through to the to him. You you there's there's just this barrier of protection. Um, we see a lot of arrogance when you know that they already know it. They don't need any any help, you know. But it's unfortunate. I've I've worked with several pro sports teams. Um, and, uh, you know, I flew down to Kansas City once to work with a soccer team and they gobbled up all the information and they loved it and they use it now, you know. So it's it's definitely something that works and it can be just incorporated, but it's getting people to admit that there's something out there that they don't know. Or that they didn't know. And, right. and if, oh, gee, there's something that I didn't already have. And then everybody starts going, well, why didn't you use this last season? We mm-hmm. lost last season. <laughs> why didn't you use it? I didn't know it. It's the nice thing about being a student. I'm okay with saying I still don't know stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to be an expert and to admit that there's things that you're completely blind to, I guess, especially if you're years into the making. Mm-hmm. That's that is one of the hard parts about being a practitioner in the FDM is that you turn over your responsibility of knowing to the patient because the patient is in charge of this treatment. And so the patient drives it. The patient knows what needs to happen. And what's fascinating is often that's your biggest impediment because everything else in medicine, you go into the doctor and you want them to tell you what's wrong. This, I, I say we have to get out of our own way. So they come, you come in with a complaint, I listen to you, and uh, you tell me what's wrong. And I just let you be in charge. And we've all gone to school for a really long time to become the expert. So to get out of our own way, to, to let the patient tell me what's wrong. What do you think I need to do to fix this? That's a hard question to, to actually say. Um, and it, and that's one of the impediments. I think using your hands, giving the patient the power to be in charge of what's going on is difficult. 
Um, the idea that you didn't learn it in school, so therefore it might not be a reality, and it and it could be against what you already know. All of those things, I think, are are part of the issue, and it's it is physically demanding at times. But again, I you know, like I said, I'd shake a chicken over somebody if it would get them better. I couldn't start my practice. You know, I, I can see twenty some patients a day on on a normal clinic day. I didn't start that way. You know, you you would see in the walk-in clinic I worked at maybe three or four manual cases. You know, I'd treat people, and you build up. It's just like going to the gym. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't run an ultra marathon from the couch. I gotta I gotta get there by training, and when you're doing manual medicine you have to uh you have to build into it there's techniques for making your stamina better um it's not a strength-based discipline we get that complaint all the time that oh i'm not strong enough if you're relying on strength you're doing it wrong um yeah there's just a lot of perception that it's hard to do um it, it's really not that complicated. And that's also one of the things that's hard for physicians. They want to be mystical. They want to fix you with, without, you know, you completely understanding. And it's so easy to understand. Most patients appreciate it. They're like, oh, that's what you did. I get, I get it. Now, there's a lot of complex biomedical processes in the back, but do we really have to completely understand them to practice it? No. Um, but to research it and all that, we probably should. Yeah, considering that there's medications, if you open up that little, like next time you get a prescription and there's a little folded up piece of paper and you open it up and it's super thin and it's tiny, tiny writing, somewhere on there it'll say the exact mechanism of this medication is not precisely known, but obviously it's re- repeatable and it's not killing people, So we're, and it has some sort of benefit over placebo, so we're still using it. Mm-hmm. The funny thing about people who say, I didn't, I didn't learn this in my sports medicine fellowship, or I didn't learn this when we were covering sports medicine. Yeah, you went to school 20 years ago. Are you using the same criteria for blood pressure, cancer screening, all of these other things that were 20 years old? No. Mm-hmm. That stuff gets updated all the time. And if you don't follow that, you're not following standard of care, and then bad things happen. So same thing should go with musculoskeletal problems. It's just it's one of those weird disconnects. Yeah, you know, you look at the... The axiom of medicine and a lot of the changes is it takes about 20 years for us to catch up. And so for something today is discovered, it'll be taught, you know, 10 to 20 years from now. Um, I think about things like PRP and stem cells, uh, platelet-rich plasma injections. Those things weren't around when I was a student. But does that mean they don't have value? Does that mean they're not, you know, efficacious? Absolutely not. But I would have to stay current. With, with this, uh, we had a gentleman who went on from, he was actually the department chair of the osteopathic program here. He went on to a sports medicine fellowship, and I, I saw him lecturing one time at a large sports medicine conference, and he, he announced to the group, he had, for, he had omitted FDM as one of the tools that he uses on the sideline. And he apologized, and he said, I didn't put it on there because the slide was actually the most painful treatments to the least painful, and everybody thinks FDM is this heavy-handed, painful treatment, and there are times when it can be. And uh, he said, I didn't put it on there because if you do FDM right, sometimes it's the most painful, sometimes it's the least painful. And then he launched into this five-minute infomercial about why it's the most powerful thing he has on the sideline. Um, And so, you know, you, you talk about sports, you talk about, Um, the military, all of these things. But you come down to it, you know, sometimes when I'm lecturing, people will see all these young athletes on my slides, and they're like, are all you see is athletes? No, but it doesn't really get people excited when you say, yeah, I treated this older person who can now get up from their couch and make it to the, you know, refrigerator without pain. It's pretty cool when you see somebody running a marathon or, Mm -hmm. you know, getting a gold medal or whatever it is. Those are the exciting ones. But it's no less life-changing when you get somebody who can now walk a mile. Um, Had one this week that she she was just talking about how she had never been able to walk before, and that was limiting her. And now after treatment, she's walking. She walks an hour a day, five days a week. Wow. And she had not been doing anything. And in our, we know by science that if you can walk 30 minutes or more a day, that's better than all of the medications at, at heart and stroke health or you know stroke risk heart risk cancer risk all of these things so you know i figure that's a win if i can get her walking that that's as good as any prescription i could have written yeah thinking about our patient base as uh as the university again serving the rural and underserved patients 
there are a lot of people in that group that work in the labor industry, whether they're working on a, a farm or whatever they may be doing. And some of these common ailments that could be fixed quickly, you would think if they were able to do that, then they're able to work and they're able to provide for their families. But if they can't, then that part of their life is taken out. And then there's a domino effect there where they end up in this vicious cycle of whatever the case may be after that, where they literally can't provide and can't put food on the table because they can't get back to health. When we're thinking about those sort of things, if there's somebody listening to this podcast today who might have some sort of an issue like that, who is dealing with some sort of a pain that's keeping them from these things that might, again, not be the the exciting, you know, athlete running across the field, but just getting back to normal life, how with it being so uh, misunderstood and so rare to be able to find somebody who's practicing it, what advice do you have for them going forward? Yeah, so what, one of the things is to go to the AFDMA website, and they we have a find a provider place. It's underutilized at the moment, but we keep trying to emphasize the development of that. The American Osteopathic Association has a find a DO site, and if you look at that site, you should be able to select either osteopathic manipulation or neuromuscular medicine, which are the two specialties that really should do manual treatments. Um, those, those two areas should guide you to um, a person in your area. Due to the power of the internet, you know, you can search and look for osteopathic manipulative medicine. Um, physical therapists, it's a little, you, you might have to do more phone calling because some physical therapists are manual based and some are not. Um, the manual physical therapists, especially the ones who've taken these modules, um, they're excellent. They're good, uh, a source of treatment. But yeah, it is a challenge, and we, we put together that find a provider site to try to address it. But, you know, getting people on it, getting people to register to be on it, that's been a challenge. Um, word of mouth is is important. You know, find out who, who so-and-so saw in whichever city, and then do they know somebody? I, I actually, I probably get a, every three days, I get a request from somewhere in the country by somebody saying, do you know anybody in this town? And frankly, it's why I fly all over, you know, trying to get this thing spread because I'm sick and tired of, of, you know, saying, no, I don't have anybody in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago, I had a guy fly from Florida to Fairbanks in February to get treated. And I was like, there has got to be some, some better thing in between from Fairbanks in February. It's not the place you want to come visit mm -hmm. unless you want to see the Northern Lights or sled dogs. Okay. <laughs> so he left Florida, which we're all looking to go to. But he, he probably skipped over, you know, 100 providers on the way, but he just knew he could get it in Fairbanks, and that's kind of ridiculous. We think, need to fix that. I think one of the first modules you taught at PNW, there was someone who, I believe, lived in Fairbanks, ended up moving to New Mexico. They drove from New Mexico to Yakima to be a demo patient. Wow. Because FDM. That's belief. I, it, that's efficacy. Yeah. It's not just belief. It's it's It works, and... Where for whatever reason she couldn't find anybody else, so yeah, that's I don't remember that. There's a lot of stuff I don't remember, but <laughs> so that's the, the third time you've said that this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. So as you're teaching a class like this one with quite a few people who are in attendance, and as you're doing them across the country, what's the realistic outlook for something like FDM in the future, where more people start to hear about it, start to see the the miraculous effects that it can have, and then start to actually put that into motion. That's actually what we're going to be meeting about today, um, how to strategize that spread. You know, so my goal is to make it part of osteopathic medicine. I want every second year osteopathic medical student to know about it. I don't care if you're a brain surgeon. I want you to have the, the idea in your head that when you're messing around with the fascia, there can be an implication and, and maybe that's as much of an issue as, um, you know, your procedure went perfect, their surgery went perfect patient comes out of the operating room they still have pain well what is that pain well you know everything in the head was fine but why are they having pain we see this all the time where this you know orthopedist has replaced a joint i had one yesterday before i left probably my second to last patient perfect knee replacement absolutely perfect you look at it on x-ray there's no problems patient still has pain and can't bend their knee fully there's something wrong and it defies what we know so we work on it from the fascial point so that spread so is is my it's kind of my focus and what i'm hoping to do it's kind of purpose is try to get it into the hands of every 
physician, osteopathic. If any of the MD schools will listen, happy to teach them. Um, we're trying to get it into more and more physical therapy schools. Um, Matt Booth, my colleague in the Fascial Distortion Model Academy, the FDM Academy, um, he, he is a, a DPT and he works um, with several of the um, physical therapy schools. I think as we grow our instructor pool, we'll have more availability. Currently, I have more requests to teach than I'm capable of doing. So we're, we have, um, like I said, I think we have four pr teachers who are out there um, doing a fair amount. I've, I've done, it's almost 70, I think, of these weekend courses um, over the last bunch of years. And I think we're at that Malcolm Gadwell tipping point. I think we're getting to that point where if we can if we can keep pushing if we can keep driving if we can gather the evidence it'll start to trickle into um well hopefully not trickle hopefully it'll be more of a wave because it'll just be a demand but yeah getting it into the hands of practicing physicians getting it into the hands of students making it part of sports medicine i think all of those things tie in to just kind of pushing it into a tsunami of let's get people better you know cost will probably be a big drive and also the adoption of uh, it's it's going into hopefully into Di Giovanna's uh, some of the major textbooks yeah. uh, in osteopathic medicine once it ends up in those and uh, getting the definitions into some of the the educational standards in osteopathic medicine means that it's n hopefully not going to be too long before it's on board exams and once it's on board exams ask and any first or second year student the number one question that pops into their head in any lecture is is this going to be on boards and which is a sad statement, but it's true. Um, so uh, getting getting the publications out there, and then Dr. Kappas Brandt's also working on a textbook. Um, so all of that is is going to feed into that. Um, hopefully, some of the talking we're doing today about uh, the military expansion uh, will be helpful because if you think about things like physician assistants, that actually came directly out of the military. You had all of these extremely well trained people who didn't have a place to fit in in the civilian life. And so that changed the face of medicine afterwards. So that's that's a the potentially the skinny end of the wedge as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the textbook will have a big impact because it's going to try to be um, more of the how-to guide. There's been a lot of theory books written, um, but this is basically going to be a book. I'm um, collaborating with Dr. Georg Herrar, the gentleman from Austria, um, and we're putting it together a book that should accompany all three of the modules and we talk about modules and they're basically separated into regions of the body and this there's been nothing that you really can follow along as you take a you know one of our modules like this weekend it's module three so that's you know jaw tmj elbow fingers feet hands headache all of those things um, but you couldn't like flip through a book and go okay I'm, we're going to study this now and so I, I'm hoping that that will make it more tangible. And we were talking earlier, and one of the, the publisher criti critique of our writing so far, Tom has been helping a lot get it to, it to actually look like English, um, described it as punchy. And uh, we're trying to still interpret what that means. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, I don't want to make it complicated in the writing. I want to make it easy because the model is easy. And so when we're writing it, sometimes you write it like, do this. And you're like, well, that's a little simple, but that's what you do. So I could go through biochemical pathways and make it super complicated. But, you know, is that more for me to feel like I'm important? Or is it preventing people from actually just knowing how to do the techniques? Mm -hmm. the, there's a board game called Othello, and uh, its tagline is, um, it takes a moment to learn and a lifetime to master. And that's, that's really the whole FDM thing is one of those things. You can pick it up in a weekend. You can start applying it the following Monday. Uh, doesn't mean that you have reached the upper limit of, of that, that application by any means of the imagination. So um, it's trying to encompass all of that, I think. But it's, it's, yeah, you can learn it quickly, but you will find fulfillment and excitement and continual learning if you keep going through it. It's not going to be one of those things where, okay, I read the book and I'm done. Yeah, I think there are people who take a module and they go, yeah, I know FDM, you know, and, and all of us who kind of make this part of our lives, we do, we do module after module, we teach them, we table train at them, we go to, you know, courses on it. There isn't a course that goes by where I don't step away from the lecture podium and go, huh, never thought of it that way. 
um, there was a big, a big moment at uh, University Incarnate Word just two weeks ago where I was like, wow. And I usually say that's when, and when that stops happening, that's probably when I'm done teaching. But until that stops happening, it gives me a better understanding of what I'm trying to do. And, and every time I go in, there was a resident at, uh, at that course, and he was demonstrating a technique to some of his buddies, and I sat there and watched him. And I went back the next week and used it in the clinic. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. I can think of it in the model. You know, we always are learning. You stop learning and you stop being effective. And so, you know, tying it into why don't people want to know this, it's, it's time, money, energy. We all have a finite bandwidth. And so how do we get that? We've looked at online, you know, learning modules. Can we do something where we can bring it to people? Now it's hands-on technique, so you need some hands-on, but can we eliminate, like tonight we'll do an introduction. Uh, can we eliminate that? And you could do it at the, you know, your own home in your boxers and you know with a cup of coffee mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to come a day early miss clinic we usually do it friday night so the local people don't miss clinic but a lot of us you know if it's a friday night course we're traveling all day to get here mm -hmm. and you miss clinic time and clinic time is production time and that impacts your in, uh, um, finances but yeah so that we're looking at different ways and you know technology is making it much more possible to do some of that online things for us, CME, uh, continuing medical education, is critical. If we don't have CME, no one comes. Mm -hmm. And so the ability, the American Osteopathic Association gives us CME uh, accreditation so we can offer it to practicing physicians um, and they get their continuing ed credits. Students don't need them yet, but they will. But So the opportunity to do this as an educational thing and get credit for it is really powerful. I mean, that, that's what keeps the people coming in. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. All right. I think we're good. I think uh, we've covered a lot of really interesting stuff. I'm happy that it took this course. Yeah, great. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming on. <laughs>